welcome the live and Zoom audience to this uh, uh, to the Jordan Center speaker uh, series, and I'm uh, extremely uh, happy to uh, introduce Professor Ricardo Nicolosi of uh, Ludwig Maximilian University of München uh, to our speaker series. Uh, Professor Nicolosi is uh, truly one of the most broad-ranging scholars in the Slavic field I know. Uh, his scholarship spans geographically Russia, Eastern Europe, uh, and Eurasia, truly giving credit to the three E's in our, uh, the name of our uh, professional organization, which very few people do. Uh, historically from the 18th to the 21st century and methodologically from the literature and science paradigm to historical poetics to rhetorical analysis of political discourses, national identities, and aesthetic practices. Uh, I could actually fill a good chunk of the time of this talk with a list of uh, Professor Gauzy's uh, accomplishments and publications, but uh, I will not do so. I just want to mention a couple of highlights, uh, well known, I'm sure, to the people here. He's author of two important books on 18th and 19th century Russian literature, both originally in German, uh, with Russian translations that go as follows, so as not to offend anyone with my horrible Russian accent in German. Peterburski Panigirik, 18th век, Myth, Ideologia, Rhetorica, in English, 18th century St. Petersburg Panegyrics, Myth, Ideology, and Rhetoric, and the field defining Vorazhdenia, Literatura i Psychiatria в Ruskoy Kulturi Konca 19th Veka, Degeneration, literature and psychiatry in late 19th century Russian culture. President Nicolosi is editor and co-editor of numerous collections of volumes on the culture and legacy of the Russian Revolution, on discourses of criminality, on narratives of the Langrad blockade, and so on. He is uh, currently working on a fascinating book project on counterfactual historical, counterfactual history in Soviet and post-Soviet Russia, and leading a large-scale project on the study of early Soviet adventure literature. So without any further delay, uh, I want to yield the floor to Professor Nikolozi for his talk on Putin's political rhetoric on the war in Ukraine. It's okay. Well, thank you so much. Nice introduction. Thank you for having me here and for coming. Um, Political rhetoric plays an eminently important role in the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. On the media battlefield, where this war is also being fought, the public speeches of Putin and Zelensky function as an effective medium for explaining and legitimizing political and military actions. The personalization and centralization of politics, which is structural in Russia, enforced by war in Ukraine, turns the speeches of the two presidents into central places for articulation and propagation of arguments for the young and against the opposite position. Addressed both to the or and to international audience, they offer both logical and emotional arguments for an understanding of the war of aggression that seems to defy any rational explanation. In my talk, I will focus on Putin's uh, rhetoric. Putin's rhetoric on the war against Ukraine is rhetoric of violence on three levels. Okay. Just a second. Um, violence and aggression can be expressed directly in rhetorical speeches, for example, through aggressive speech acts, so like threats or so on. Uh, this will be A here on this slide. Political rhetoric also serves as just to justify and legitimize violence by means of argumentation, which can be logical reasoning, logical in the rhetorical sense of the word, logical reasoning, as well as affective emotional persuasion. In the case of Putin's oratory, we are dealing with all these aspects of a rhetorical violence, which complement and potentiate each other. My focus uh, in this talk will be on uh, B and C, so on the argumentation, the 
uh, effective one and the logical one, but uh, I would like to start with a few words on the first aspect, uh, aggressive speech acts. And there is no doubt that spreading fear and horror is part of the Kremlin's communication strategy. Uh, the threat to make use of nuclear weapons, uh, as you know, repeated since the very start of the campaign is only one element of it. In his speech uh, on February 24, uh, 2022, Putin said, um, quote, no matter who tries to stand in our way or all the more to create threats for our country and our people, they must know that Russia will respond immediately. And the consequences will be such as you have never seen in your entire history. Okay? And this is yeah, Putin uh, saying these words <laughs> in this moment. <laughs> There is also uh, the intentional barbaric mode of leading the war, which partly um, a consequence of uh, aggressors' military and technical backwardness reminds one of catastrophic scenario reminds one of catastrophic scenarios from World War II. The war against Ukraine is a public ritual that provocatively displays violence, a demonstration of power that intends to horrify victims and observers as like. Uh, it would, however, be wrong to reduce the war in Ukraine solely to a symbolic, to his symbolic dimension. Um, despite the obvious desire of Putin's regime to punish, despite its deep-seated hatred of democracy and freedom, <clears throat> this war is not the consequence of impulsive decisions. There is a certain logic behind it, which is by no means new, because the Kremlin propaganda apparatus formulated the possibility and even the necessity of a military intervention in Ukraine loudly and clearly years ago. And in my talk, I will try to reconstruct first the logic of this war from the Russian point of view by focusing on uh, Putin's uh, rhetoric. So the, for the beginning, a uh, couple of words on, on Putin's rhetoric in general. Um, the importance of Putin's speeches for today's political discourse in Russia can be hardly overestimated. Uh, they gave, they have a programmatic function from the very beginning, actually. Um, and at the least since 2012, uh, Putin speeches at fixed points uh, throughout the year, uh, for example, the presidential address to the people and, and other occasions, as well as at special events such as celebrations marking the annexation of Crimea. Here you see this. Um, Putin's um, speaking in 2014, this is one of the most important speeches he gave. Uh, we formulated uh, the Russian policy of the next years uh, in a very clear way. Um, these uh, speeches have served as central channels for a formulation of ideologies that are taken up by all the state media and then propagated, illustrated, and so on. Uh, Putin's rhetoric is the monologic rhetoric. That's all. Um, the, the, Political rhetoric in itself uh, is, was taught by, uh, thought by Aristotle as uh, dialogic rhetoric, right? the, the medium of democracy itself. This is not the case with Putin. Mm, this is a monologic rhetoric that accepts no contradiction and has, has the quasi sacred status of proclaiming the truth. How is Putin uh, like a speaker or like an orator? Vladimir Putin is an interesting speaker because he is good at playing with rhetorical devices. He is certainly not a born orator. This is clear, right? He is not somebody like Barack Obama uh, or Bill Clinton or Michelle Obama, <laughs> uh, for example, or even is not like Paris Yeltsin. Um, just a second. Paris Yeltsin um, who was a um, made a kind of revolution in a political rhetoric uh, in the late uh, Soviet Union. You see him here um, in Moscow in 86, I think, uh, propagating um, an, another form of rhetoric, a more populist one, a direct address to the people. In the early years, was Yeltsin a really good speaker, uh, or even he is not uh, as good as uh, his, pol his political father, um, Anatoly Sapchak, mayor of St. Petersburg in the 1990s, um, Putin's rhetoric is stylistically uh, varied, and, and his arguments are versatile. So, generally speaking, uh, we are now in the realm of ethos. So, what Aristotle called ethos, this is the uh, which appeals to the speaker's authority, credibility, and the self-fashioning of the of the speaker. Um, so, this. This uh, Putin had at least 
three rhetoric uh, personas, if you want, right? Three rhetoric personas. Depending on the situation, addresses, and context, uh, this nuanced rhetorical eclecticism uh, gives a concrete discursive shape to communications that range from technocratic speech, which will be when Putin presents himself as a man of deeds, uh, who has extensive knowledge in all important political areas and solves concrete problems. This is just one rhetorical persona, right? The other one is um, our. Um, spontaneously non-rhetorical, sometimes very vulgar statements, uh, where Putin expresses his determination as a strong leader, sometimes using the language of criminals. Um, you remember maybe in 1999, uh, when uh, he was prime minister, in the context of the beginning of the second Chechen war, he said, uh, he talked about whipping out terrorists in the outhouse, right? Machit so Sarsi. This is a criminal language. Okay. Or um, the third person that he has, persona, rhetoric person, is um, our speech is laying claim to historical significance. Among these various rhetorical roles embodied by Putin, uh, the latter has recently clearly gained the upper hand. Putin presents himself, on the one hand, as Russia's leading historian. Uh, publishing, uh, so to speak, scientific articles uh, on history, lecturing at length and with great pleasure about history, uh, and at the same time as a historical personality, that is, a person who has accomplished a, a historical mission, which consists in the restoration of the territorial unity of the so-called historical Russia of the Russian world. Uh, it seems now that the, this uh, technocratic moment uh, bothers him and he leaves it to the government and to the governors. Uh, we have also pseudo-dialogic discursive situations um, in Putin's rhetoric is such uh, this format, which is very famous, uh, the TV, um, TV show, I would say, right? This is a show, a direct line with the president of the Russian Federation it's going on more than 20 years now, uh, where Putin answers questions from across the country in a live television broadcast, um, this also formed part of the presidential's or the president's careful staged media image. Um, these are orchestrated dialogic distances and create a sense of emotional proximity between the president and his people. Following an old Tsarist tradition, uh, Putin uh, receives supplicants and promises to take care of his citizens' needs uh, while um, TV images articulate this vision of a vertically guarded democracy. Okay. Putin's rhetoric is the engine of Russian political discourse, also and especially with regard to the war against Ukraine. Uh, this discourse, which I will attempt to reconstruct in the following, is initially based on a paranoid interpretation of history. So this is the first, uh, the, the basis of what I'm going to say it later. Now, I will try now to reconstruct this discourse on why this war. Um, actually, the uh, reasons for this war were formulated uh, already in 2014 uh, by Putin in his speech um, following the annexation of Crimea, and even the possibly before. Uh, the arguments have, been seen, uh, have, since, have since been repeated with unbelievable, unbelievable abstrusiveness uh, as a warning and a threat, frequently and readily. Summarize briefly, the Russian argumentation is based on the following logic. Ukraine has turned into an instrument of Western powers under the leadership of the United States that are seeking to restrict Russia's geopolitical power by making Ukraine into an anti-Russian. So this is the first uh, um, um, kind of topos in, in this discourse. Uh, Ukraine became, because of the United States, an anti-Russian. Uh, there have been similar presidents in history. Uh, I'm, I'm just... Um, um, Repeating the discourse, right? this is not my position here. Mm -hmm. there, have, there have been similar precedents in history. After all, earlier empires, such as uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth in the 17th century, the Szesz uh, Pospolita, and the Habsburg monarchy to which regions of today's Ukraine belonged, aspired to the same. So, history, story, history is repeating itself. Seen thus, Ukraine, just like Belarus, is not an independent political subject in its own right but an integral part of Russian statehood, 
of uh, what Putin calls historical Russia, the origins of which are believed to be in the so-called Kievan Rus. Ukrainians, Russians, and Belarusians are then not distinct ethnic groups, but a kind of tripartite national identity with a thousand year history. In the opinion of the proponents of this uh, view, following the Maidan uprising in 2014, the Nazis, driven by the collective West, usurped the power in the train, and they have been perpetrating genocide against the Russian speaking population in Donbass. Russia uh, has had no choice but to act, to act to stop the genocide. This is what Putin said many times, right? To denazify the country so as to put an end to the humiliations and insults that have been inflicted upon Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, primarily through the so called expansion of the NATO to the East. On the global scale, it is about uh, because the, the discourse is uh, um, very much a geopolitical one. On the global scale, it is about building a new multipolar world order through countering geopolitical expansion of the West and reconquering the historical Russian territory. Um, so this discourse is not uh, by no means new, uh, but it does, uh, does not make this rhetoric, rhetoric any less disturbing. Okay? Uh, it is disturbing not even because it is based on obvious lies. There is not genocide going on uh, in Ukraine and there are no Nazis in power. They're just democratically elected in, in Ukraine. Uh, they are democratically elected representatives who tend to be to have a populist orientation and they can be replaced in the next election, uh, uh, in the next election cycle, which is a detail that by no means is self-evident in a possible country, by the way. Um, but uh, the Kremlin and its propaganda apparatus are not trying particularly hard to supply evidence for these assertions. Instead, they refer again and again to the lie with which the second Iraq war started in 2003. Um, the argument concerning human rights, postulating that when acts of genocide are committed, a military intervention is considered justified as, so as to protect the rights of the people affected, is used by the Russian leadership mostly through an analogy, analogy to the situation in Kosovo in 1999. It, it is then meant as an argument in support of Russia's actions. Russia is supposed to be acting now exactly the way NATO acted then. Any military operation could be declared a humanitarian mission because it was the West and not Russia that undermined the principle of human rights. So this argument based on international law are exclusively arguments by analogy. So you did that, we are doing the same. So. Um, all this in the is in the tradition of the Kremlin's well-known communication technique that the historian Timothy Snyder calls implausible deniability. Right? This is very well known. Its goal is to undermine the validity of such notions as truth and facts so that everything ends up being simultaneously true and false. Um, now, what is truly disturbing in the Russian discourse on Ukraine, and this would be my point actually, um, is its, uh, is its paranoid character. Russia perceives itself as an eternal victim of geopolitical power games of a collective West that has always been threatening its territorial integrity. The offensive against Ukraine then becomes a necessary and much longed for war of defense, uh, which is actually a very top, typical in a um, uh, in a rhetoric of war, this is nothing new, right? This war of aggression is always declared as a war of defense. In the new world order thus created, Russia regains its natural geopolitical role. This is, this is one of the main goals of this uh, war. Vladimir Putin becomes a figure of a historical and even messianic scale, a leader who achieves the gathering uh, of Russian lands, leading Russia into a decisive battle in Ukraine, which is a kind of uh, biblical Armageddon, following which the new and just order, world order must emerge. So a multipolar world order. Searching for the intellectual and historical sources of this dark tradition of thought has meanwhile become a core subject of the scholarship on Putin, which is summarized very briefly, uh, which yeah, to explain uh, Putin's rhetorical web in, in this discourse, in which world uh, plays Putin's rhetoric, which is of central importance for understanding the war in Ukraine. So I see there are three levels. 
um, uh, there is a rational level, so rational in the rhetorical sense, based on logos, centered on arguments of international law, but also on a monocausal argumentation. Uh, then we have an historical level, which is a narrative one, um, and then the rhetorical affect, so which be rhetorically speaking, uh, pathos. Uh, that seeks to evoke emotions. These three lines of argumentation are closely interwoven and mutually potentiate each other. So let me start with the first level, that of logos, of, of, of um, a logical, rational, logical argumentation. Uh, we have, first of all, arguments of international law, as I already said, right? Uh, and they played um, a, a central role in 2014 for uh, the justification of the annexation of Crimea. In his speech on March uh, 18, 2014, Putin invoked the right of peoples to self-determination and compared the situation in Crimea with that in Kosovo in 1999, as I already said, right? Um, he does basis his argumentation on causal and analogical inferences. So here we have, um, I mean, the, the argumentation is a causal one because we have international law. This is like a nomothetic structure and then um, the inferences are causal, but then they are always supported by the analogical argumentation that you have done this before, right? <laughs> In Kosovo 1999. Um, but also for the current justification of the beginning of the war in Ukraine, arguments of international law regarding an uh, alleged a genocide of the Russian population living there are of central importance. Here, the comparison with the justification of NATO's military intervention against Yugoslavia in 1999 without a UN mandate is again essential. Uh, the second aspect of this rational argumentation is the um, monocausality, uh, which is at the core of Putin's logos. I already talked about this paranoid uh, argumentation, right? Um, and this paranoical argumentation that everything uh, at, as a, a one cause, which is the hegemony of the US after the collapse of the Soviet Union, is inherently coherent because it's so simple, right? Mm -hmm. Through this, you can explain everything. And if you look at the, at the chains of, uh, of causal arguments uh, on effects of this one big cause, this is the beginning, uh, this looks like very coherent, right? There is no, there's no contingency, this is a plot against Russia, basically. Um, and this uh, monocausal argumentation postulates a single cause for all conflicts in the world since 1989, especially for the ongoing threats against Russia. Uh, the cause is the monopolar, monopolar world under the hegemony of the US. So this supremacy of the US and its, its vassals, uh, the, cause, the so called collective West, right, is the cause of a whole a series of world crises and violation of international law. And the chain is uh, quite long. It starts with uh, Kosovo, uh, 1999, Iraq, 2003, and then the um, spring revolutions uh, in the Arabic country, then in Libya, Syria, and Ukraine. And everything gets one or both. And NATO's so-called eastward ex expansion should be seen in this context as an instrument of pushing Russia back. Um, just one quote. I could have uh, show you uh, for three hours. Quotes on this point, but uh, on in a speech on February 24, uh, February 24, 2022, Putin said for, for the United States and its allies, it is a, a policy of containing Russia with obvious geopolitical dividends. For our country, country it is a matter of life and death, a matter of our historical future as a nation. This is not an exaggeration, this is a fact. It is not only a very real threat to our interests, but to the very existence of our state and its sovereignty. Okay, so this was about the, um, uh, the logical uh, level, very briefly. Then we have the historical narration, um, which is a narrative one. So we don't have causal or analogical kind of other arguments, but an uh, historical narration uh, that Ukraine belongs to the Russian world, right? This is, uh, is explained historically. Um, and this has become increasingly important in Putin's speeches and has marginalized a little bit the argument based on international law. So the historical one is becoming, with this order of aggression, more important. With the help of an extremely tendentious historical narrative, 
Putin explained this argument in July 2021 in a long article, a pseudo historical article called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukraines, uh, which was basically a kind of declaration of war in July 2021. Putin appeals to the old master narrative of the Russian imperial historiography of the late 19th century. So, this idea is very old, it is already formulated uh, in the late 19th century claiming that Russians and Ukrainians are united not just by a shared heritage, but also as a kind of natural entity, evident in their orthodox faith, linguistic proximity, and cultural similarity. Seen from this perspective, the idea of, Ukrainian, uh, of the Ukrainian nation as independent from Russia is nothing short of perverse from this position. Um, however, the fact that this idea had become a reality was due solely to the Bolsheviks um, nationality policy. It's just a quotation from this article. The Soviet national policy secured at the state level the provision of um, three separate Slavic peoples, Russian, Ukrainian, and Russian, instead of the large Russian nation, a tri uh, triune uh, tri people comprising Veliko Russians, small Russians, Belarusians. Therefore, more than Ukraine is entirely the product of the Soviet era. We know and remember well that it was shaped for a significant part on the lands of historical Russia. Okay. Um, the political discourse on to, in today's Russia, uh, and this is uh, my main claim here in this talk, is based on this paranoid interpretation of history, in which uh, two main plot lines of, of key significance. I think I will talk only about the, on the first one, and we'll see if we have time for the other one. Uh, the first one is a sense of deep resentment, which is driving all the discourse forward. Um, and this uh, is connected, but this is part of this rhetoric of all effects of pathos, right? And it's not the logical argumentation, but it's the emotional one. And then we have discursive practices of reenactment. At the same time, both elements are evidence of a very particular perceptions of temporality in Putin's Russia. We are the past, interpreted in a conspiratorial way, determines the perception of the present and the future. So a little bit about this uh, temporality um, in Putin's Russia. The official political discourse in today's Russia is unequivocally, unequivocally oriented towards the past. It has been years since the Kremlin was able to offer the citizens of the country visions of the future that would be motivated by ideas of modernization and progress. You don't have them in Putin's Russia, right? At least since 2012, uh, when Putin was re-elected um, and uh, was the year of mass protests in response to this election, the space uh, for reflecting on the open future of the country, its renewal and transformation has been becoming more and more restricted. Political goals and future endeavors, uh, without which not even an autocratic system can exist, are now programmatically aligned with the past, so that Russia's future becomes imaginable only as future past. The history of Russia, where a distinction is hardly made between medieval Rus, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union, they are considered, they are considered all the uh, Russian past, so to speak, becomes a reservoir of time-tested models for the shaping of the future of the future Russian state. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine too is to be understood as a restorative act on the way towards rebuilding a lost geopolitical order. The goal of the invasion is the uh, termination of the Belarus Accords um, between Russia, Ukraine and Belarus, or Belarus that marked the dissolution of the Soviet Union on December 8, 1991, right? This accord, uh, Belarus Accords, marked the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, signed by uh, Russia, um, Ukraine, and Belarus in 1991. Uh, once Putin and Lukashenko signed in the autumn of uh, 2021 economic and military agreements within the two countries, um, it was time to bring Ukraine back into the tripartite union and thus to rectify, no matter the price, what Putin called a great historical error. So the goal is the past, <laughs> a restorative uh, idea of this. 
The goal here is by no means founding a new Soviet Union, as you know, but rather the reconsolidation of the Union of Territories, what uh, that Vladimir Putin calls historic production. His belief that the future of Russia is to be found in its imperial past can be described with Svetlana Boyd's words as a form of restorative nostalgia that seeks a transhistoric revival of the past in the present. This is the source of this idea of a restorative nostalgia. The restorative nostalgia is based on an experience of loss and of loss and demands the pain uh, of loss be healed through a reconstruction of tradition. In connection with the Russian discourse on Ukraine, restorative nostalgia does not only refer to a simple correction of a historical error, uh, this error being the separation of Ukraine from Russia, but also to a powerful emotional charge. This is assigned to this loss in the emotional rhetoric of privation that focuses robbery and partitioning. So we are now slowly moving to the to the point of the rhetoric of effects and emotions. Um, this, uh, so, so, so to speak, uh, historical error is seen, um, is uh, been expressed uh, in Putin's speeches through um, emotional rhetoric of privation that focuses robbery and uh, partitioning. The present day Russian political discourse is built on repeated reference to phantasms of loss, constantly alluding to humiliation and offense, and, and giving voice to fantasies of hate and retribution. For example, in his speeches, Putin talks uh, of uh, parts of Russia's own historical regions having been severed and detached. Right? This is rhetoric of privation, of amputation, if you, if you want. Um, uh, how, how after the declaration of Ukrainian independence, Russia felt as if not only as something been stolen from it, but as if, that, as if an outright robbery has taken place. Um, this rhetoric of privation fits upon and amplifies the real experience of loss and despair that Russian society went through after the end of the Soviet Union. The recent history of Russia appears in this reading as an interrupted sequence of humiliations. And they are the emotional driver for imagining a future that is geared towards the rectification of losses suffered. The political discourse in today's Russia is shaped by an intense emotional economy of resentment. Um, one of the most striking markers of Putin's time is the cultivation of victim narratives. A society like the one in Russia, which is very much individualized, atomized, and depoliticized, is held together not so much by positively defined values, although the uh, constitutional reform in 2020 gave formal grounding to identify forming significance of tradition and conservative values. More importantly, um, most Russians are united in a certain emotional reality, the reality of resentment. The link that keeps together the residents of the country is shared sentiment of a deep-seated grievance as a result of alleged humiliations and as a logical consequence, the desire that Russia rise from its knees. Since 2007 at the latest, uh, that is since Putin's uh, very famous um, appearance at the Munich Security Conference, the Russian president has been constantly presenting Russia in his speeches as a country that has suffered a profound injustice, having been repeatedly insulted and deceived by the collective West. Uh, the conflict around Ukraine thus becomes, as explained before, the latest stage in the political agenda of containing Russia, uh, pursued by Western powers. In the current Russian political discourse, the so-called collective West, also named the Empire of Lies by Putin, assumes the role that, uh, of the agent that inflicted the humiliations and wounds that the nation lived through and the impact of which is feels. This makes the West into the real target of the Russian thirst for revenge since Ukraine is presented as part of the puppet of the West. The rules for ascribing particular states and institutions to the collective West are somewhat flexible, but the notion is concrete enough to allow for an approximate localization of the enemy. Quite frequently, the source of the humiliation suffered by Russia is made even more abstract through allusions to the so-called Russophobia, uh, that is, anti-Russian sentiments. 
um, if, as you know, maybe for appro approximately 20 years now, every form of criticism of Russia is interpreted as manifestation of the hatred of Russian culture and the Russians that is deeply rooted in nations across the world. The reasons for the existence of this supposedly universal and centuries old pathological state are explained only vocally through references to a collective invite uh, of the geopolitical power of Russia. The idea of anti-Russian sentiments is a paranoid victim narrative that cannot be falsified. Uh, it explains everything. Uh, and as any paranoid narrative can serve as an explanation for a whole variety of phenomena. The world is against Russia because Russia is Russian. This is the paranoid foundation of the narrative of anti-Russian sentiments. Um, now, the Russian, Russian logic of resentment reduces the complexity of the political processes that have occurred in Eastern Europe, Europe since the collapse of the Soviet Union to a single narrative in which the roles of the agents, the West and their victims, Russia is clearly defined. And you see a connection to the monocausal argumentation I was talking about before. For example, in a speech marking the annexation of Crimea in 2014, Putin formulated the opposition between a genuinely honest Russia and a deceitful Ukraine that governs, uh, that is governed by the West. Uh, quote, we understand what is happening. We understand that these actions were aimed against Ukraine and Russia and against Eurasian integration. This is already 2014, right? And all this while Russia strived to engage in dialogue with our colleague in the West. So Russia always tried to uh, to have a compromise. And all this uh, while Russia tried to engage in dialogue with our colleagues in the West, but we saw no reciprocal steps. On the contrary, they lied us so many times, made decisions behind our backs, placed us before an accomplished fact. But there is a limit to everything. <laughs> if you compress the spring all the way to its limit, it will snap back hard. You must always remember this. Another threat, right? The exhibition and even cultivation of one on's past impotence and of the progressive increase in the intensity of insults and the level of frustration up to a sentimental bo bottleneck of emotions was transformed by Putin into aggression rhetorically and militarily. This aggressivity in the Russian political discourse that has been promoted and vividly illustrated all these years in the Kremlin's official discourse also come, comes across in a dramatic appeal to the fears in the face of fragmentation and partitions of Russia that the West apparently craves. Um, this is because following the Russian line of reasoning, Ukraine's breaking away from Russia is only the first stage of a plan that is supposed to lead to a division of the country and its transformation into separate independent states. Um, the Russian propaganda points again and again at the existence of Western plans for a division of Russia in single independent states. Uh, you can find fanciful maps uh, with states uh, such as Moscovia, Siberia, Ural, Kazakhstan, and so on. I brought to you just one example of a map which is attributed to Ukrainian. You see Ukrainian map there. Uh, it has uh, a very um, extreme example of uh, Russia being colonized. Uh, by the, by West powers, um, completely colonized, uh, attributed to Ukraine. This is to be a map of land, which is there, right? Um, such horror scenarios of Russia being divided into uh, frequently feature. Um, sorry, such horror scenarios of Russia being divided frequently feature in Putin's argumentation. The war in Ukraine, in which the Russian Federation violently wages off parts of a neighboring country becomes in this context a brutal reaction to the state-generated fears of a complete disintegration of Russia as a state. Uh, in Ukraine, Russia realizes those very horror scenarios that it had rears with itself as a subject. Invasion and occupation, force, assimilation, and colonization of the country by foreign powers, territorial division and fragmentation, terror, and extermination. So these fears of being occupied, uh, uh, forced assimilation of colonization by foreign countries is, uh, realizes uh, a, um, a Russia now in Ukraine. Ukraine becomes what Russia, according to this line of state propaganda, could have become. Yeah? 
And incidentally, incidentally, Ukraine turns into a projection surface for Russians on anxieties. Also because the war of extermination clearly shows what devastating consequences can follow a regime change that was the result of the street of street protests. The Russian Maidan, that absolutely would be absolute horror scenario of Putin's regime, should not happen no matter what. I think I will stop here. Um, I have one last point, but uh, maybe in the discussion, if you want, I think it's. I'm, I mean, do we have time? If, if we have you would like, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, totally. Ah, okay, totally. So the next, uh, um, an additional point to this, um, uh, to this um, paranoid uh, discourse nourished by, uh, by strong emotions is the idea that um, the present uh, in Russia is considered as kind of historical reenactment, right? Um, um, I've been talking about this victim narrative that is present in Russian discourse, political discourse, and the flip side of that is um, uh, a modeling history as narrative, not of victim input, but of heroism. The state propaganda invests significantly efforts into preparating the heroism uh, in of Russian history from patriotic education in schools through major exhibitions such as Russia and my history um, to history films and television programs. As an example, suffice to mention the military patriotic entertain or entertainment part of the Patriot in Moscow, a kind of military Disneyland with museums, uh, military equipment one can explore and experience directly, and the cathedral of the Russian armed forces. Uh, here, politics of memory is combined with commercializing military history so as to cultivate living forms of patriotism in Putin's own world. Um, in this patriotic world, generated as an artificial reality, reenactments uh, play a central role. And reenactments are authentic looking recreations of historical events, mostly of military characters. One example is the Reenactment of the Battle of Berlin uh, and the attack on the Reichstag in the Federal Park in 2017, for which the Reichstag buildings were reconstructed. You can see here yeah, Soviet soldiers attacking the Reichstag. Now, it might seem like a harmless, spe uh, harmless spectacle, but it corresponds to a certain perception of history that has a profound impact on the present day Russian society. Okay? This is because today's Russia experiences historical times or historical time as a kind of temporal loop, an endless repetition of the same that stops being just repetition and becomes absolute presence. The war against Ukraine is also to be understood as a historical reenactment because from the, from the Russian side, it is conceptualized as part of the great patriotic war. The assertion that in the wake of the Maidan uprising, Ukraine fell into the hands of Russia hating neo Nazis, perpetrating terror, murder, and pogroms against the Russian population has been obsessively repeated since 2014. This particular claim does not seek to draw an analogy with events of World War II. Um, because the idea is that. Um, is this about <clears throat> nationalist forces yet again being at work in Ukraine, forces that are antagonist to Russia and obedient to foreign powers. Back then, these were uh, so-called Banderovtsi, so supporters of Stepan Bandera, collaborating with the Nazis, and today the descendants, so to speak, are in control of the post-Maidan Ukraine. For Russia, it is a, re a replay of the existential threat being attacked by the West via Ukraine. Okay. A threat that became a reality more than once over uh, more than a thousand years of Russia, Russia's history. This was this in this discourse is what it. Seeing thus, Russia is destined to face this confrontation again and again, that is to wage a war to protect its sovereignty. Uh, the discursive Nazification of Ukraine in the Russian propaganda can appear plausible in Russia because it is um, embedded within the heroic cult of the Great Patriotic War. The glorification of the victory of 1945 is linked with its continuous presence in the media, the conscious objective of which is the elimination of the temporal distance 
and the staging of a victorious battle against Nazi Germany as a historical boom. However, yet another consequence of the years long continuous exposure to the propagandistic narrative of a Nazi Ukraine is that the past and present of the war are not always perceived as different temporalities, but as a temporal continuum. It is not that Russia is fighting in Ukraine today because it fought against Nazi Germany back then. It is Russia continuing the great patriotic war as if it never stopped, okay? Um, an illustration of this approach is provided by the speech that Putin gave um, on the Victor, uh, Victory Day 2002 and repeated it in 2000 and uh, this year as well. In that speech, yesterday and today, the fight against Nazi Germany and the special operation in Ukraine are interconnected so closely that it is often not clear which events he is talking about. This speech too repeats uh, the familiar arguments about Ukraine that Putin has been representing uh, since 2014, so that the speech itself ends up being a kind of rhetorical reenactment. At the same time, it frames the history of Russia as a temporal loop, as a repeated reenactment of an enemy attack, followed by heroic defense and a triumphant victory. Uh, the so-called times of troubles in the 7th century, when the Tsarist Empire was under Polish rule, Napoleon's Russia campaign, the Great Patriotic War, and the current special operation are all referred to this speech in this speech as repetitions of a particular event, always the same, defending the motherland. The temporal layers uh, that are still separated here flow into a kind of permanent present when uh, next in the same speech, Putin speaks of Russian victims in the Great Patriotic War in connection with the Maidan uprising, without mentioning the special operation in Ukraine. However, in the same breath, he declares that the Russian state is going to support the families of those who died at the front. And the logical links in the speech are so bold that uh, uh, there appears to be no difference between Russian victims in the different historical contexts since they are all part of a single never-ending war waged in the name of defending the motherland that fell victim to a foreign invasion. Uh, I think I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo, for this extremely lucid and at the same time bleak uh, account. Uh, I think I'm going to, if you uh, stop sharing screen, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I am going to then open the discussion to, to the audience and the chat, and I already see a number of questions in the chat, let me just open it, um, ah, okay. Um, maybe you yes, please, please suggest Sorry. Mm -hmm. maybe questions maybe. from the audience. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'm just not sure if I'm having access to what I need to be having access. I just wanted to, yeah, yeah everything. I'm good. sorry, I have no questions in the chat yet, but perfect. Yeah, if, and if you would like to ask, chat. yeah, if you would like to ask questions, please do so in the chat or. Also alert us and we will unmute you and uh, yeah, and mm -hmm. please, the audience. Rosin, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Nikolosi, for presenting us really, you know, a very coherent uh, uh, picture of Putin's rhetoric with, uh, you know, how the different, these different elements work together. And towards the end, you began to suggest moments when they also contradict each other and these are actually the, the ones that I would like to ask you more about or, or how this rhetoric, how Putin's rhetoric actually has evolved very significantly because uh, I do remember how in the two, 2000s and maybe it's not necessarily emanating from him but from his co-political apparatus, mm -hmm. you know, the, the rhetoric of stability and economic growth was main, and, mm -hmm. and this enemy figure really not that a significant presence on the larger political horizon. And yeah. it was only after 
that stability and growth came to an end, that yeah. the, the enemy appeared. So I'm, I'm just uh, wondering if you uh, could also address the, the moments of incoherence within Putin's rhetoric and, and moments when it breaks down in mm -hmm. you know, possibly ways that are potentially recognizable to the audience and, and also uh, yes, moments, uh, and also if you could place the, this rhetoric of violence in, in, within a larger historical, uh, within a larger trajectory of Putin through, because yes, so much has changed, like these yeah. historical pretensions uh, of late, you know, were to me really absent in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. So I was here talking only about the um, discourse on Ukraine and how it's formed through uh, Putin's rhetoric. Uh, Ukraine was not an issue uh, in the 2000s, a little bit, of course, uh, during the Orange, Orange Revolution, uh, there were some peaks, right? But this was not, not this uh, intensity of uh, argumentation became uh, with, uh, with the Maidan revolutions and started uh, 10 years ago, uh, at the end of 2023, where the media uh, was clearly forming all this discourse in, in the Nazi Germany of the um, of, of the collective West um, threatening uh, Russia through Ukraine um, it was formed quite quickly um, and remained quite stable for ten years. So this is, I would say, this is quite um, quite stable. Mm -hmm. um, um, so Putin's regime. Uh, so. Um, um, one moment in your question is uh, Putin is, of course, not a dictator in the sense that all decisions are taken by him. This is a regime where you can speak, we can speak of, of a collective Putin, right? To them belongs, belongs um, an apparat, so it's, and this is a, a little bit bigger. He is the one who has the symbolic center of, of this regime and the one who, in his speeches, formulate this, uh, formulates um, ideologies that are not propagated never. So, this is the reason why this rhetoric is so important, not because this is just worse than indeed. <laughs> um, and um, so the, the regime in itself is uh, completely ideological, uh, ideological, right? The Putin's regime at the beginning was based on this uh, idea of um, uh, guaranteeing um, uh, a low level of wealthy, right? Stability, uh, patriotic feelings about Russia and uh, after the 90s, playing with the negative side of the 90s. And this was enough until 2012. <laughs> and then there were mass protests uh, uh, combined the re-election of Putin's president. Still then, uh, since then, um, um, the, um, this, this pact with uh, the people was still there, but was, was changing very much and rhetoric where was also changing. Um, this, um, what is also a uh, kind of continuity <clears throat> is that um, in, in, in Putin's rhetoric is the fact that uh, this um, Russia being uh, threatened by the West was from the very beginning there. And the idea of, a multi, of the, the need for multipolar world order instead of monopoly, this was always, always there. They didn't play very much, uh, was always there. Um, even the late Yeltsin was talking about this. And um, so this regime is playing with a couple of narratives and, and topics and trying to adjust them according to the situation. It's very flexible, the regime. Um, it became less and less flexible in the last years with brought uh, to this war against Ukraine. Um, and what I uh, what was so summarizing yet now was the starting and this, uh, the starting point of the special operation against Ukraine. Uh, during the, uh, the, the the first year, the rhetoric didn't change very much. It was quite stable. Uh, they were all acting uh, as um, doing um, acting as um, the um, special operation was going on instead of a war. Right? It was supposed to be a special operation war. Uh, the things changed in the rhetoric of Putin radically. Uh, uh, at the end of 2023 with the uh, partial mobilization and the, the, the last speech of the year, the New Year's speech of 2020, uh, 
two uh, was uh, a speech quite unusual for a New Year's speech, uh, but was the speech which marked the beginning of a long war. And this is a little bit, uh, so the, uh, the justification of the war remained a little bit the same, uh, but then uh, was not so much about a special operations going on and don't, don't care about this Russian population. <laughs> we, will, uh, we will do it, we will do the job, we finish the job. Um, now, since, since the beginning of this year, it's more about, well, this is a, a long term conflict. This is a war against, the war is there, this is against the, the West. This is a, a long going war. Uh, and um, Russia is uh, now, uh, um, so, so to speak, in a uh, war which is going, uh, going on for a long time. This changed a little bit, uh, a little bit the rhetoric um, uh, of Putin. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the war, the rhetoric of war uh, is becoming less and less important um, um, as it was in 2023. So uh, 2023, remember everybody was expecting was Putin would, would say, uh, Zelensky will answer to it, or on the contrary. Uh, now the role of the, of the presidential rhetoric is becoming less important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And could I just, by way of follow, yeah. follow up, um, ask you what, why the, the rhetoric of the presidential speech itself? So in other words, there's some, some kind of an institutional shift happening where the functions of institutions are changing. Is that why we, we're dealing with the fact that the role of the presidential speech is minimized? Or? Because the war is becoming, an, it's not an, an emergency situation anymore. Mm -hmm. War for everybody, it's like everyday life. Right. Uh, this is this is the key. Mm -hmm. um, not that the presidents are becoming less uh, less important, but they were symbolic figures in the first months of the war. Uh, they symbolized the two countries very much. And mm -hmm. Zelensky found um, so I think it, it, it's a team, of course. Uh, Putin doesn't write the, the speeches itself, right? Mm -hmm. Himself, there's uh, this team doing this. They found uh, Zelensky found a, a very effective uh, way of uh, presenting the Ukrainian position and uh, a political rhetoric, uh, uh, political rhetoric which was very effectful. A completely different one with uh, another media, media, uh, media. Uh, in uh, with another function of the media, uh, working very much with uh, his um, former team and um, uh, recording uh, speeches like uh, small, uh, um, uh, with like small films. This is a completely different territory than this one by Putin, who was usually sitting in his uh, office. Uh, and um, at the beginning of the war, he was just telling history lessons, right? It was, Lecturing on this, this is if you read the two speeches he gave in February twenty two uh, to the uh, to the Russian population twenty uh, uh, first and twenty four. They were basically history. It was lecturing about history mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in a very um, in a very boring way. <laughs> um, and and Zelensky found um, an uh, anti anti boring rhetoric, so to speak, in the first months of the war. Uh, war became just uh, something which is uh, unfortunately ordinary. It's a status, mm -hmm. status quo, and um, and both uh, both presidents uh, were uh, adjusting their trying to adjust their rhetoric, and there are ways, right? Um, Twenty three is the year of Zelensky. Now it's a little bit changing. I don't know. So mm -hmm. sort of war. Thank you. Does, uh, do we have anything in the chat yet? No, no, not yet. It's okay, great. And in the audience? No. I, yeah, for something? No, no, no. no. Yeah? No, okay. uh, no I, I have a qu another question about the dynamics of the of change that we talked about, which is, mm -hmm. I was very curious um, when you mentioned that the monocausality mm -hmm. paradigm has uh, has now yielded a little bit to the narrative historical paradigm in which Russia, in which the idea is not so much to find the 
reason or the uh, the kind of the mechanical mm -hmm. reason, right, of the cause of the of the war so much as to implode it mm -hmm. in a large mm -hmm. uh, universal historical schema, right? right? Mm -hmm. But why do you think that change occurred? When did it occur? Did you you have a sense of that? And what um, um, this is so. Um, this historical argument became uh, more and more important uh, in the after the after uh, the annexation of Crimea. So uh, the speech by uh, by Putin in two thousand fourteen was more about uh, international law. Uh, this is uh, like the, the freedom of people of um, um, of uh, the, the, the yeah um, the. the the right of people of self-determination. Yeah, the self-determination, thank you. Um, and by um, the argument by analogy, so Kosovo was there, mm -hmm. why not Crimea and so on. And then uh, it became uh, more and more an historical argument that this um, Nazification of Ukraine, uh, right, this is a, a long-term project by the West. Mm -hmm. The argument was already there, but it became more important. And this monocausality um, of the, the, the West threatening uh, being the, the cause of all uh, the problems that we have in the world became more important. And this is an, an historical argument. Uh, so the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, Russian uh, people being now in different states, this is the, this is the idea that Putin had. It is, he has no nostalgia, no, no, no nostalgia for the Soviet Union, but uh, um, the, the problem was, um, Pointing it is this the Russian population, Russian speaking, ethnically Russian population now lives in different countries. This is from its side this tragedy. And um the um uh, the uh, the idea of reconstructing this historical Russia became even more important and um, was one of the main uh, ideas that uh, led Putin to the um, um to the um Idea that a special operation would be could be possible, right? That uh, bringing back Ukraine into the sphere of influence of uh, um, uh, of uh, of Russia, mm. and the uh, support of this argument is, as I try to demonstrate by uh, a rhetoric of emotions, which is for me the most important part. Mm -hmm. Rhetoric of emotions, so um, of humiliations, um, Russia being. Humiliated by the West for many many years, um, the um, and then um, uh, the propagating these fears of uh, uh, be attacked and uh, and um, the idea of, of, of bringing back Russia to the geopolitical order or to, to the natural geopolitical order yes to be and this um, rhetoric of emotions is basically. Um, Probably the most important part of all this rhetoric. Yeah. Because, would you think that? Sorry. To is it okay to just follow this up? Yeah. Is it? Do you think that this um, this has to do? I mean, this is maybe a little bit more even of ontology than the rhetoric uh -huh. question. But is there? Do you think that the um, affective dimension of your analysis is so important because it actually connects the rhetorical? Um, the rhetorical um, uh, domain with the experiential domain. Yeah, of course. Right. Okay. Of so, course. is this this depiction of the? I mean, the re reality of the uh, of the of the young Russia, uh, Russian state in the nineties was a difficult one. Everybody knows what happened in nineteen ninety one, ninety two, ninety three, and so on. And this uh, experience of uh, of loss and of despair mm -hmm. uh, is there, and. Um, and for the for the Putin regime, uh, is on one side is to say uh, we are now in a better situation. On the other side, is using these fears that uh, Russia can be can um, became what it was in the nineteen nineties, um, uh, dominated by the U.S. and so on, um, and treating the nineties as a, a, a black hole of the Russian past. Um, um, and a black hole in which uh, you have only experience of loss, humiliation, and despair, um, and that this war is a revenge for this. Mm -hmm. We are fighting back. Right? This is uh, something that heads together. <laughs> uh, 
uh, or the whole thing. This is uh, this is so important. This is uh, uh, this feeling of uh, in Russian is called abida. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one about uh, you know whether it is possible in any way to to conduct any. Uh, reception studies of, of that rhetoric and and, and see mm. uh, you know because it's very easy to um, to guess the extrapolate upon the effect but in practice it may be mm -hmm. you know a very different set of reactions you know that it produces among different groups of Russian population yeah. and I'm just wondering whether um, <laughs> Theoretically, it is possible to to study questions of perception of, the, of that rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the second uh, question is um, also very poorly formulated, for which I apologize. Uh, you know, there is there is a way of uh, seeing the rhetoric is uh, is cohesive and. Uh, in internal cohesive and logical, there is also a way of seeing it as uh, uh, responding to whatever tactical turns uh, mm -hmm. the the regime is having, and then just reflecting those uh, tactical uh, mm -hmm. those those turns, and, uh, and so in the first mode of uh, seeing it as cohesive, which probably is. Maybe your argument, especially in this more provocative suggestion that mm -hmm. the war of 2022 was already anticipated in earlier speeches on Ukraine mm -hmm. after 2014. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so, so if, if with uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I'm struggling to, to formulate the question, but but. Uh, um, do you see the possibility that uh, conversely it is, it is merely the, 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 that that rhetoric uh, merely reflects uh, um, despite some appearance of, of unity and cohesiveness mm -hmm. merely reflects the, the various uh, um, political contingencies and yeah. economics uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you um, for the question. So I, I'm not saying that the war was inevitable because um, we find these uh, arguments in political sp in Putin's speeches and speeches for other politicians uh, since we have been finding them for many years. No, 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 no. So the possibility of a confrontation on Ukraine in Ukraine uh, and a war against Ukraine, well, kind of, the possibility was formulated, but. Um, this regime uh, in Russia is, uh, politically speaking, uh, becoming um, more and more um, un un not flexible, right? But this is on its nature is a sort of flexibility because it is it's not any kind of ideological restraint or it's just maintaining the power. It's everything. This is uh, and um, so. Um, of course, um, uh, the, the course of the war uh, will, um, and now it's the economical factor, the military factor, so on, uh, will, will um, present many solutions, and then the regime will decide what is good, what is bad, and you can adjust and adapt and adapt this strategy to that. This is what they're doing all the time, right? Uh, at the beginning of the war was a confrontational uh, rhetoric which uh, didn't have any space for uh, for um, um, uh, any space for um, different solutions. Was clear we want to do this. This is our job. This is the job. But it can changes uh, quite uh, frequently and uh, quite uh, quite. Uh, um, uh, quite um, quickly because um, the media control is absolute in Russia, and so you can uh, let them all work for you. This is what happens, right? 
in the speeches are formulated by the opposition and then are propagated towards the media. There's, there's no, 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 not such a problem of uh, uh, in constructing a, a, a media landscape, a propaganda landscape, uh, which would lead to peace, for example, is quite a, a peace that is uh, for Russia, of course, um, favorable or not. And to your first questions, um, I can say I'm, I'm a literary historian or literary student, so of course I analyze the discourse, um, but uh, sociologists are working course uh, on this um, it's tough and uh, with all difficulties as you have in Russia and sociological research finding out what uh, people really think um, at the beginning of the war was practically impossible uh, to have went answers because everybody was acting uh, uh, shocked and, and, and refusing to answer to a question now it's changing because this is like everyday life it became uh, but still, there are so many uh, different Russias in Russia, so, so many different um, um, geographically and economically and everything. Uh, so this is impossible to say what um, uh, what this uh, rhetoric means to them. It's not that um, there is any belief, a belief in Putin or the belief in the regime in Russia. It's just, uh, this is not the case. There is not patriotism for the regime, or uh, there are some ideas that are propagated and they are there and everybody can um, use them and they do, there is nothing else. There is not a counter argument. So the use of these arguments is there. Um, they are formulated uh, quite, uh, uh, quite openly um, in, in these speeches and, and on the propaganda media um, and they have an influence. This, of course, because you don't have anything else, right? Um, and um, I believe that as the emotional part of this rhetoric is the most important because you don't have to explain very much with them. You don't have to deal with historical facts. You don't have to check anything. It's just this feeling of revenge. Of, yeah, let's do the job, which is the most scary part of the thing. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I'm Valeria Sikeria from the University of Venice and now visiting professor scholar at Stanford. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, for your interesting. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have a question, more than a question, a curiosity. Yes. Because uh, um, I, would, I was wondering how the reenactment of history and uh, historical narrations. Um, of the great patriotic war and the struggle against the Nazi fascism mm -hmm. can overlap with the fact that uh, one of the most important uh, ideologues of Putin um, policies is Alexander Dugin, mm -hmm. which is uh, also very popular among uh, um, uh, far right uh, uh, European movements. Mm -hmm. So it is. Uh, this, uh, um, as uh, you define it, this paranoid rhetoric also a little bit schizophrenic. So, I'm, I'm, I'm... yeah, it's interesting. So, uh, when I was talking about Irin, Dugin, and all the others, I was saying that um, this is like a sports now uh, in uh, the scholarship on Putin, just find out which are the sources. I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that the, the, there are, of course, uh, ideas that were formulated. Even uh, one years ago, this is nothing new there. Um, but this, those are not ideologies that are uh, put into practice now. But uh, it's just um, kind of uh, arguments that can be useful or not. And Dugin has not this influence that everybody thinks he has. No way. Uh, I mean, and um, uh, Putin, Dugin is not writing the speeches. <laughs> It never did it. Um, and um, so, um, um, and the arguments which uh, Putin is using, uh, for example, um, um, yeah, which Putin is using, uh, they can be uh, arguments that you find in the right wing discourse or in the left wing discourse. Mm -hmm. About colonialism, I mean, America and US colonizing. Uh, 
uh, the global south and Russia is fighting the war in Ukraine uh, to stop this with an argument that you can, uh, uh, can uh, many of the uh, leftists can agree with. So against the uh, capitalist uh, American hegemony. Not that Russia, uh, Russia is the most capitalist country, <laughs> one of the most capitalist countries we have in the world, uh, but in the, in, the, in the rhetoric, you can use this argument, which is an old Sovietism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Soviet Union uh, against the, um, the, uh, um, against the, uh, the capitalist world. Then you have uh, an rhetoric which is more conservative, uh, traditional family value uh, formulated uh, through the uh, Orthodox uh, Church um, and, um, and uh, um, fight against alternative way of life, mm -hmm. so to speak, right? Um, this is well, something that uh, appeals to Orban or yeah, to many others, so to, to more conservative thinkers. You can find everything there. Uh, this is um, it's not schizophrenic. It's just, uh, it's just putting elements together um, in order to try to legitimize this something which is um, it doesn't make this world doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make really any sense. It was not planned as war. It was planned as a special operation. Uh, like the uh, occupation of Prague uh, in '68 was the same, right? Uh, let's bring back Ukraine. Let's the job bring back to, to Ukraine to us, um, and and uh, do it in two weeks. The problem began later, <laughs> for for Russia mm -hmm. and for everybody, and um, yeah. So, so so this is um, it's schizophrenic, but it makes sense. Yeah. Um, may I do another one? Uh, yes. If there's nothing, then there's nothing there. Um, uh, so yeah. So this again is a follow up a little bit to the earlier question in your response, uh, Ricardo. Made me think of uh, uh, try asking you if if you have any thoughts about the way in which this Putin rhetoric fits into a kind of right wing um, um, intersectional <laughs> right <laughs> for 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 lack of a better word um, or international right wing mm -hmm. kind of rhetoric right because resentment obviously is yes. uh, hugely important in other right wing rhetoric as well. Do you do you feel like it sort of fits in, um, in in ways that are that nevertheless make it uh, specific uh, to its particular situation, or do you feel like it sh it shares more than it uh, differs? Yeah. Uh, so this is a this part. This is a resentment. Is a part of this. Um, uh, this is part of this um, part of the rhetoric, which is more accessible. Mm, for the right wing movement in Europe, um, fighting against uh, so, so the, uh, the same in the 20s, 30s, a plut 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 uh, uh, plutocratic uh, democracies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, mm, this, is, uh, this is very effective, I would say. Um, uh, but again, um, um this is based on this idea of uh um of uh, of resentment which came um, in europe this is in, in the us i mean accommodated mm -hmm. by the uh, by the trump supporters this is everything is not, it's not about resentment this is the and the um the uh, which is not the far right this is also the uh, uh, the movement in the, in the protest in, in, in France, like mm -hmm. the, how to call it, the yellow jackets, the yellow jackets movement is also, I mean, this is, um, and then during the pandemics, all the, uh, the movement against uh, the, uh, the laws, uh, the pandemics laws were everywhere in, in Europe, this was a kind of, this is the pharma, 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 pharmacy industry, right? They are fighting them and we don't want to be colonized uh, from them. 
and this is uh, it's, it's enough. Paranoia. It's enough. It's verging into paranoia. Right, um, right, yeah. right, right. And they're all similar. So the uh, when the war started last year uh, and the pandemic uh, end, it was the same time. The same groups were supporting now Russia and saying mm -hmm. this is a, a war against Russia. <laughs> uh, uh, so from the pandemics to Russia, um, there are very very strange connections uh, which are based on this idea of the emotional resentment, which is, and the uh, resentment is as an object which is uh, quite far but concrete at the same time. Um, and this is a, this is a, a vogue idea of a capitalist uh, plot uh, against the war, the Jewishness, this is the Jewish element, the London, or, yeah, this is just <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff there. This is, uh, this is something very unclear at the same time, um, at the same time, always the same. Yeah, and um, this rhetoric is appealing to them too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there are no more questions in the audience or in the Zoom, um, then we are actually kind of running. We're out of time. In fact, as a matter of fact, out of time. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, Ricardo, uh, once again for this.